Uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce our uh, next speaker, James Mazur. Um, a few words about his career. Um, uh, Jim got his PhD at uh, Harvard with Dick Ernstein, and uh, then uh, he moved to work uh, for a few years with Alan Wagner at Yale, and then he returned to Harvard, and after about eight years, uh, if I'm correct, he left to Southern Connecticut State University, where he is. Um, Jim has um, been a member of major societies, uh, associate editor of leading journals. I will not bother you with the details. He's known by m most of you. Um, I'd like to emphasize a few things about his research. Um, he has done research on a variety of topics, uh, all related to, to learning and behavior uh, and conditioning. Uh, some of them include theories of reinforcement, uh, processes of choice, um, the effects of delay of reinforcement, probability of reinforcement, uncertainty. And um, uh, today is going to tell us about choice and uh, hyperbolic decay of reinforcement strength. There is one final thing uh, before uh, uh, we hear Jim's talk I want to mention, because that's something that uh, I appreciate in his work. Uh, and that is, it's the clarity of his writing. Uh, I have been impressed uh, by reading Jim's uh, work on acquisition of preference or this hyperbolic uh, delay, uh, decay with delay. Um, that's something that is very striking, is to see the clarity and the elegance of his writing and his ability to communicate sometimes difficult ideas in a straightforward way and you think uh, it's very easy. Yes, after the fact, it's very easy. So um, please uh, join me in welcoming Jim Mazur. Thank you. Thanks very much, Armando. I um, have been doing work in this area for many years. And if I had to pick a, a couple of key terms that uh, I've found a lot of my research is about, it's been choice and delay of reinforcement. And one of the main points I want to make today is that these two are related. They often go together because many choice situations involve delay in one way or another. And I'm going to talk about several of those today. A very basic idea that's been around for a long time is that the strength of a reinforcer, or what I'll call its value, decreases as the time between the response and reinforcement increases. This is a simple concept, but it's a crucial one uh, for understanding everything I'm going to talk about today. So here are the topics that I plan to cover. First, what is the shape of that decay function? If we want to use it to make predictions, it would be very helpful to know the mathematical expression that describes delay of reinforcement. Secondly, what factors affect the rate of decay? How does it vary for different reinforcers, different individuals, different species? Then I'm going to show you how you can use the concept of delay of reinforcement to apply it to many different choice situations. I'm going to talk a little bit about fixed versus variable delays. Uh, I'm going to talk about risky choice, which involves a certain or a guaranteed reinforcer versus one that may or may not occur, an uncertain reinforcer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I call procrastination, involving choice between immediate and delayed work. And then finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about procedures where the choice is not made with a single brief response, but more of a continuous process. So let me begin with the question of what is the shape of the delay function. Over the years, different theorists have proposed different ideas. One that was proposed by Clark Hall and many others a long time ago is an exponential equation. And in this equation, V is the value or the strength of a reinforcer. A represents the amount of reinforcement. E is a constant, the base of the natural logarithm, about 2.72. D is 
delay, and k is a parameter that determines how quickly the decay, how quickly delay affects reinforcer value. The exponential is a very common idea. It's found in physical systems like radioactive decay, follows an exponential function. And the basic idea is that as time passes, the value of the reinforcer in this case will decrease by a common percent, a constant percent. So for instance, for some animal, it might be the case that as every second passes, between response and reinforcement, the strength of that reinforcer declines by another 10%. Well, that's one idea. Another one that has been applied in some versions of the matching law is a reciprocal equation. And here the simple idea is that there's an inverse relationship between delay and value. You double the delay of a reinforcer, its value decreases by half. One problem with this equation is that if you set delay equal to zero, then value becomes infinity. And that doesn't seem to make very good intuitive sense. One way to deal with that problem is to add a constant, like a one in the denominator, and we get what I call a hyperbolic equation. That's the one that I've used a lot. Uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, I know Michael Commons has used it as early as 1982, and it is similar to the reciprocal equation, except that it doesn't start at infinity. It starts at A for an immediate reinforcer and declines from there. And finally, as one more, uh, some people have suggested that uh, we may need to raise delay to some power to scale it, and so I've included a version of the hyperbolic <laughs> with an exponent B. Now, how can we tell which equation is best? Well, there are several ways. One is to look at your standard self-control choice situation, where an individual is given a choice between a small, more immediate reinforcer and a larger, more delayed reinforcer. If you were here yesterday for SQUAB, you've seen this several times already from different people, but I'm going to do it again. Suppose you're given a choice between uh, $100 now and $200 in a year. Which would you choose? Well, in a typical audience, I found they're usually split about 50-50. Some people would pick one, some would pick the other. But if I give you a slightly different choice, what if you had to choose between $100 in four years and $200 in five years? Here, just about everybody picks the $200 in five years. And notice that these two are similar, except I've added four years to each of the two alternatives. If you're one of those who picked the immediate reinforcer in the first case and the $200 in the second case, that's an example of a preference reversal. And Many years ago, back in the 1970s, George Ainsley demonstrated that preference reversals of this type are inconsistent with an exponential decay equation. And the reason for that is because exponential equations state that the value of each reinforcer declines by a constant percentage over time. So whichever one has a higher value now is going to have a higher value forever into the future. So that's one piece of evidence that suggests that the exponential is not a good choice for the decay, uh, the delay of reinforcement function. Another way you can answer this question of which equation is best is to use an indifference point analysis. An indifference point is simply a set of two alternatives that an individual finds equally preferable. With humans, you can ask a series of hypothetical questions like the ones I've given you. And by doing that, you might find, for instance, that a person is just about indifferent between, say, $100 now and $200 in 18 months. That might be, for one person, an indifference point. With animals, uh, I've used an adjusting delay procedure to obtain indifference points. And I'd like to show you how this procedure works. Uh, we have a chamber with three response keys. 
the animal has to peck the center key, which is white, to start each trial. And then the animal has a choice between red and green. The red key is called the standard key. It leads to a delay with red house lights. That is some fixed quantity, let's say 10 seconds. And then two seconds of food are given. Then there's a long inter-trial interval, about a minute, the next trial begins. If, however, the animal chooses the green key, there's what I call an adjusting delay. That one changes according to the animal's choices, but it gets to eat food for a total of six seconds, three times as much. The way the adjusting delay works is if the animal makes two choices of the green side, the adjusting delay is made longer by one second for the next set of trials. If the animal makes two consecutive choices of the red key, the adjusting delay is made shorter by one second for the next set of trials. We keep doing this about 60 trials a day for a couple of weeks, and finally, we arrive at a point where the animal is choosing the two about equally often, and that's an indifference point, one indifference point. So it takes a long time to do this. Then I might switch to another condition where the standard delay is now five seconds, repeat the procedure for another two weeks or so, and get a second indifference point. And what do the different equations predict about this situation? Well, the predictions of the exponential are quite interesting and clear. The solid line there shows that the exponential predicts that the slope of that function, where we have the delay for the smaller reinforcer here, I control that. The delay for the larger reinforcer is controlled by the animal's choices, and that's what the adjusting delay tells us. The exponential predicts that the slope will be one no matter what amounts of reinforcement you use. So that's a very strong prediction, a 45 degree angle line, and it predicts a y-intercept of zero. The curve starts above zero on the y-axis. So that's what the exponential predicts. The reciprocal <coughs> predicts that the slope will be steeper, greater than one. That's the dashed line. But it has a unique prediction of making a prediction that the y-intercept will zero, be zero. It'll start at the origin. The hyperbolic equation predicts a slope of gra greater than one, a steep slope, that's the line over here, but a y-intercept greater than zero, starting someplace above zero. And the hyperbolic with exponent is similar, except it predicts a curvilinear indifference function. Well, I did this experiment with pigeons, and here are the results from four pigeons. And although it's a little bit hard to see here because the y-axis is compressed uh, to fit it all in, all of those slopes are greater than one. They're the numbers by the d2. They're greater than two, in fact. And all of the y-intercepts, the first number in the equation, is greater than zero. So these data seem to suggest that the hyperbolic equation provides the best account of delay of reinforcement in this function. And notice that the data are pretty linear, so that tends to suggest that the exponent is not necessary. Now, you can do the same thing with a slightly different procedure where we replace the delays with ratio schedules, so we make the animal work. And this would be a case where, for instance, to get the small amount of food, the animal might have to make 10 pecks. To get the larger amount of food, the animal would make an adjusting number of pecks, and we adjust until we get an indifference point, and then do it again for another indifference point. Karen Grossbard and I did this experiment back in the 1980s, and here are the results from ratio schedules for a large versus small reinforcer. And once again, the slopes are all greater than one. All of the y-intercepts are above zero. They are pretty straight lines. So that suggests that, again, the hyperbolic equation is the one that is favored. So what I concluded from this is that whether you use a simple delay or create a delay by adding a work requirement that has to be done, the hyperbolic equation does a pretty good job of describing the data from this type of experiment. And that's the equation I'll be using uh, for the rest of my examples. What factors 
affect the rate of decay. Well, if we go back to this hyperbolic equation, you can think of 1 over k, that free parameter, as a reinforcer's half-life. And by that, I mean this value tells us how long the delay has to be before we reduce the value of the reinforcer by 50%. So for instance, if we found that a person uh, is equally uh, happy with $100 now and $200 in 18 months, that would be a half-life of 18 months. The $200 is worth $100 immediately. And you can go back at, uh, look at some of the published studies that have been done on delay of reinforcement and estimate the half-lives. And I've got a representative sample of data from a variety of experiments that I'd like to show you in this table. Some of these are pigeons, some are studies with rats, some with humans. Some involve food or water. Others involve hypothetical questions for food or alcohol or money. What factors make a difference? Well, one is the type of reinforcer, it seems. Notice that the half-lives are very different. It seems as though one distinction you might make is between primary and secondary reinforcers. Uh, primary reinforcers, food and water, escape from noise, secondary reinforcers like money. But I think a better distinction is between reinforcers that are immediately consumable, that you can consume on the spot, like food or water, or get an immediate escape from noise, and those that the consumption is delayed, like money, where you can't spend it right away, or questions about food or alcohol that the quantities are so large you couldn't consume them all at once. So that seems to make a difference in terms of how long people or animals would, uh, would wait. There may also be species differences. I've looked at a number of studies with pigeons and rats, and it looks to me that the decay functions for pigeons are about maybe three or four or five times faster than for rats. Rats seem to be better at waiting for the larger delayed reward. And if you look at the data from uh, human subjects where you're dealing with immediate consumables, it's longer still. Now, there are always problems risks in making these sorts of comparisons across species because of differences in the designs of the experiments, but I am convinced that there are some real species differences. And I'm also convinced that there are individual differences within species. <laughs> uh, here are some data from a study that I did with uh, pigeons showing the decay functions for four pigeons, and you can see by the data and the fitted curves that they are not all the same. And if you look at the values of K, which describe the rate of decay, they're substantially different. Now, that could be due to measurement error or something like that, but I don't think it's all that. I think there are some individual differences. And that's certainly true when you look at data from uh, human subjects. If we go back to the early research of Walter Michel in the 1960s, he found, when asking children, questions like this, individual differences based on age or socioeconomic status or other factors of the child's home environment. Uh, a more recent study by Green, Fry, and Meyerson uh, asked hypothetical questions about money and found that children could wait the least, followed by young adults, followed by older adults. and. Uh, there have been a lot of studies lately. I just mentioned uh, these studies by Bickle and Odom and Mitchell looking at smokers uh, versus non-smokers, and they found that smokers are more likely to choose immediate money than non-smokers. And that's interesting because the question isn't about an immediate cigarette. It's a, about a question about immediate money, which seems to suggest that there may be some cross-reinforcer generality differing from one individual to another on how willing people are to wait for a delayed reward. Now, I don't mean to suggest that uh, this means that the ability to wait is some immutable trait. There are lots of things that people can do, as you probably know, to uh, 
avoid the temptation of a cigarette or a high calorie dessert or an impulsive spending spree this is where behavior analysts can help you can teach people how to use pre commitment or stimulus control or positive reinforcement or punishment to make it more likely that will people that people will choose the reinforcer that's better for them in the long run but what the way I would summarize this literature is that there are vast differences in this decay rate for reasons that I don't understand and if any of you have any ideas about why they are there I'd be eager to hear them but the difference between a decay rate of one second and a decay rate of seven or eight years is about a hundred million so there are huge differences here that need some sort of accounting for now I'd like to talk about how you can apply this same decay function to different choice situations and I want to talk about one that I've always uh, found interesting choices where an animal must choose between a fixed versus variable delay so uh, this is an, another example of an adjusting delay procedure in this case all the reinforcers are of equal size three seconds but the red key the standard key leads either to a two second delay with red house lights and then the reward or an 18 second delay with red house lights and then food the green side is again an adjusting delay and we try to find an indifference point because the average of 2 and 18 is 10 seconds you might think logically that the animal would find indifference or be uh, choosing the two equally often when that delay is 10 seconds but that's not what happens the animal shows a strong preference for the variable side and this delay has to be reduced substantially before you get an indifference point and uh, let me just show you uh, an expanded version of the model that accounts for this uh, basically what this equation says is that if you have an alternative that has different delays and different delays we take the probability of each delay multiplied by the hyperbolic equation add up all those values and get a composite if you're not comfortable with mathematical equations let me uh, show you visually what's going on here what that equation says is that the value of a variable delay is the average of the values of the parts so in this case I've taken this example there's a hyperbola the bars show the theoretical value or strength of a reinforcer delivered after a two second delay which is a very high value a reinforcer delayed 10 seconds is a lot lower a reinforcer delayed 18 seconds has a still lower value but not that much different than the 10 so that when you take the average of these two bars that's the value of the reinforcer that could either be delayed 2 or 18 seconds and you can see that that is higher than the value of the 10 second delay and that's the explanation that the model gives for why animals prefer the variable side uh, here's data from four pigeons in one experiment why, where I used a, a number of different variable delays so for instance 0 and 20 is a case where the variable delay was either 0 or 20 seconds here it was a case where it was either 2 or 18 seconds in each case I got an indifference point all of those pairs add up to 10 seconds but you can see the indifference points are much smaller so this point here tells us that for this animal an indifference point was reached when the adjusting delay was only about one and a half seconds compared to a variable delay of zero or twenty the curves are the predictions of the hyperbola with one free parameter k and they do a good job of accounting for the results so in summary what this analysis tells us is that the reason that animals show a preference for reinforcers after variable delays over fixed delays is that the short delay even though it only happens some of the time has such a high value when it does happen that it makes that alternative more valuable 
and if you use the hyperbolic equation, you can predict the results in a quantitative fashion. Another example where I've applied this equation to is risky choice. So here's the scenario. In this case, the standard alternative, the red, 20% of the time leads to a five second delay with red house lights and then food. The other 80% of the time, it leads to a five second delay with red house lights and then nothing. In both cases, there's a 25 second inter trial interval and then the next trial begins. The green side is an adjusting delay that always leads to food. And so the animal is choosing between a, a guaranteed reinforcer and one that is not guaranteed. And again, we can ask, what is the length of this delay that will make the two alternatives chosen equally often? Well, uh, in 1986, Racklin, Logue, Gibbon, and Frankel made an interesting hypothesis. They suggested that probabilistic reinforcers are functionally equivalent to delayed reinforcers. Now that makes some intuitive sense because if the reinforcer is not guaranteed, it might take one trial to get the food, but if it doesn't, then you've got to wait for the second trial to begin and there's some delay, or it might take three trials or more. And if you apply their logic to this situation, you could do math which says, well, with 20% reinforcement, it will take on average five red key trials before food is delivered, on average, and there will be four intertrial intervals that separate those five trials. The intertrial interval is 25 seconds. And if you add that all up, that suggests that that variable delay occurring, uh, variable probability of 20% should be equivalent to the adjusting delay, which guarantees a reinforcer, if that adjusting delay is 125 seconds. You just add up the numbers and you get that. Well, when I did the experiment, uh, that didn't happen, not even close. The actual difference point was about 17 seconds, which suggests that the animals are, using some terminology, highly risk prone. They're much more likely to choose a risky alternative than would make sense in some logical way. Uh, also, I found that if you increase the inner trial interval from 25 to 85 seconds, that has no effect even though it's greatly slowing down the rate at which the probabilistic reinforcers are going to be coming. So it should have made a difference. So what I did was to suggest that maybe the basic idea of Racklin and his colleagues was correct, but we need to think about probabilistic reinforcers as being equivalent to those delivered after variable delays, not just fixed delays. And the reason for this is because that's really what's happening. If you have a 20% chance of reinforcement, the reinforcement might come after the first trial or the second or after many more than five. So it's like a variable delay. Secondly, and this is the part that seemed odd and still seems odd to me, because the intertrial interval made no difference, I assume that when we're calculating delays, we'll only count the time that the animal spends in the presence of those red and green lights because the inner trial interval when the lights were white had no effect on the choice. So I did the math using the same equation and calculated what would be the value of the reinforcer if it occurred on the first red key trial or the second or the third and so on. Multiplied all of those numbers by the appropriate probabilities to get an overall value of the probabilistic alternative and I was able to account for the results pretty well. Here are the data from an experiment uh, where I varied the probability from 10% to 100%, and there were two delays involved, either zero or two second delay. The data points are the group averages. The solid lines are the predictions of the hyperbolic equation with k set equal to 0.3. So here's another case where I was able to apply that same equation, even though the way it was done seemed counterintuitive to me. Another example that I want to give you is what I call procrastination. If you look up 
in the dictionary procrastination, you'll see something like uh, postponing until later something that should be done now. To that, I would add, postponing often leads to a worse situation later. Uh, for example, uh, if you postpone paying a bill, you may be faced with interest and penalties. If you postpone doing a small repair job on your car or your house, you may be faced with a larger repair job and a bigger expense later on. If you postpone studying for an exam, you may have to do an all-night cramming session and get a lousy grade anyway. So in many situations, postponing the work makes more work or more expense. And a, a number of years ago, I did a few experiments where I used this operational definition of procrastination with pigeons. Choosing a large amount of delayed work over a smaller amount of immediate work. And here's the procedure that I used. Uh, if the animal pecked the orange key, there was a two second delay, and then the animal had to do some work, fixed ratio eight, eight key pecks. Then there was a 15 second delay, and finally food was delivered. So that's one alternative, the standard alternative. If the animal pecked the blue key, there was a 15 second delay, and then an adjusting ratio. I adjusted the number of key pecks, again, according to the animal's choices, uh, then a two second delay, and food. So in both cases, the total delay is the same, but in one case, the animal gets to postpone the work requirement by an additional 13 seconds by choosing the green key. And so the question I ask you to try to guess is, how much work would the pigeons do at the indifference point, given that they can postpone the work by another 13 seconds? The average for the group of pigeons that I tested was about 25 responses. So that, I would say, is procrastination in the extreme. The animals were showing that they would make, well, three times as many responses just because the onset of that work could be postponed by 13 seconds. Now, that same idea uh, was also demonstrated in a little study that I d did, which is sort of the counterpart of preference for variability, but involving work requirements. And uh, this procedure is a little different. The way it worked was, uh, for all the options, Free food was delivered on a random time schedule for a total of 55 seconds every trial, no matter which choice the animal made in all conditions. But what varied was on each trial, there was a timeout during which the animal had to complete a fixed interval 10 second schedule. No food was delivered at the end of the 10 seconds. It just returned to that period where free food was delivered at random times. And in different conditions, I altered the placement of this timeout. In one, it was fixed. In the other, it was variable. And it went like this. What I'm showing is the standard side. The green bars represent periods when free food was being delivered at random times. So in the fixed condition on the left, a peck at the green key led to always a 10-second period where food might or might not occur at random times sometimes one, sometimes perhaps more than one reinforcer. Then, time out, 10 seconds, and the animal had to complete a fixed interval schedule. Then 45 seconds more in which food might occur at any time. On the variable, in the variable condition, when the animal pecked the green key, either there was a 20 second period in which the animal got uh, free food, at random times before the timeout, or that timeout occurred immediately. Now, in this case, what I found, I could just tell you the results very simply, uh, the animals tended to show a preference for the fixed condition. And the way I tested this was by having another key, a red key, which had an adjusting uh, delay as a comparison. 
the animal showed a strong preference for the fixed alternative. And the same logic, I think, applies. That is, the idea is the same as in the case of preference for variability with reinforcers. With, in that case, the immediate reinforcer has a large effect on choice, and the animal prefers that to the other side. In this case, the immediate event is something that's mildly aversive, a work requirement, and so the animal tends to pick the other alternative. Well, all of these choice situations that I've talked about so far are discrete trial choice situations because they involve making the choice with a single brief response. But as you know, there are many studies in the literature where extended choice periods are used, such as concurrent schedules, such as those used to study the matching law. Concurrent chain schedules have also been used in many different studies. And in recent years, I've been trying to extend this hyperbolic equation so that it can account for choice with extended choice periods. The model wasn't designed for that. It was designed for discrete trial choice periods. But I've developed uh, a model that can try to deal with this. And in the remaining couple of minutes, I'd like to show you in a non-mathematical way how this model works. First of all, here's a concurrent chain schedule. That involves an initial link period. And that's a choice period where, in this case, there are two white keys. Each of them has a VI 60 second schedule. Occasionally, a peck on this white key leads to its terminal link. The left key turns green, the right key turns off, and the animal must now complete another schedule, a fixed interval 30 second schedule for food. If the animal in the initial link pecks at the right key, occasionally it will turn red, the left key turns off, and the animal is in this terminal link, and here a 60 second fixed interval schedule must be completed and the animal gets food and then we go back to the white keys. The usual measure of preference in this procedure is the number of responses or the ratio of responses on the two white keys and in this case as you can probably guess the animal will make more responses on the left key because it's associated with, with a shorter terminal link than the right key. Well in order to deal with this I developed uh, a variation of this model called the hyperbolic value added model. And here are its assumptions. First of all, I assume that the same old equation, the hyperbolic equation, works in these situations. We can calculate the value of a terminal link by measuring the time from the onset of the terminal link to food. We can calculate the value of the initial link by measuring the total time from the onset of the initial link to food, which is a variable amount of time. So I'm assuming the same equation can apply, but the new assumption is that choice proportions depend on the amount of value added when the terminal link begins, when the keys change color and the animal is in the terminal link, compared to the value of the initial link. And I built in a type of matching assuming that response percentages will match the relative amounts of value added in the two terminal links. Now, if that doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, I understand. Uh, let me show you how this works using uh, a diagram. Here's that same schedule. And the bars on the right show, using this method, the theoretical values. The value of the initial link, the white bar, is low because here the animal is far from food on the average 75 seconds away. The value of the red terminal link is larger because now the animal is just 60 seconds away from food. The value of the green terminal link is larger still because here the animal is 30 seconds away from food. And in order to predict choices, I subtract the value of the initial link from the values of the either terminal link to get the amount of value added when the terminal link begins. And that's what these two bars on the right represent. 
And after doing that subtraction, you can see that, in this case, th the model would predict about a 3 to 1 preference for the green side to the red side. Now, one phenomenon out of many that you can see if you do studies with concurrent chain schedules this is called the initial link effect. And that is simply the case that if you shorten the initial links, preference will become more extreme for whichever choice the animal was initially showing a preference for. So if we change these 60 second schedules to VI10, you should see more extreme preference for the green alternative. That's what studies have shown. And I want to just show you how the model accounts for this. Uh, on the top is just a repeat of the previous slide. And on the bottom, what happens when we shorten the initial link to 10 seconds. The only thing that changes is the value of that initial link. Now the white bar is larger because while the animal is in the initial link, it's not as far away from food anymore on the average. And if you do the subtraction, green minus white, red minus white, you get the amount of value added and you can see the preference is more extreme. It's about 5 to 1 in this case. So the model correctly predicts the initial link effect. What I did uh, is to apply this model to data sets from several dozen experiments and compared the results of this model to those of a couple of other popular models, Randy Grace's contextual choice model and Fantino's delay reduction theory. And if you give the same number of free parameters to the models, they all do a pretty good job of accounting for concurrent chain data. So we're still debating amongst us which of these models is the best. Uh, but I'll say one thing in favor of the hyperbolic value added model is that it takes the same equation that has worked well in the discrete trial choice situations and now I'm applying it to the uh, cases of extended choice periods. Well, let me summarize what I've talked about today. First of all, I tried to show you that delay of reinforcement is a part of many choice situations, both in the laboratory and in everyday life. And for both humans and non-humans, the delay gradient seems to be well described by a hyperbolic equation. When people have done these studies with uh, hypothetical questions and human subjects, the data are also well described by a hyperbola. Now, further research is needed to see whether this is really the best equation or whether some refinements of it are necessary, but it does a pretty good first approximation in any case. The rate of decay varies tremendously depending on the species, individual differences, and particularly with reinforcers. If you deal with primary reinforcers like food or escape from aversive stimulus, the value of the reinforcer, its strength, declines in a matter of seconds if it's delayed. If you're dealing with, well, things that cannot be consumed immediately, the decay rates may be in the order of years. So there are very large differences. And I showed you that the same basic equation can be applied to other choice situations involving preference for variability, choice involving uncertain reinforcers, what I call procrastination, and other choice situations that I haven't told you about uh, today. And finally, uh, I've told you a little bit about this hyperbolic value added model that takes the same equation and tries to apply it to choice periods that are longer in duration. The hyperbolic model that I've shown you here may or may not prove to be ultimately the best way to deal with delay of reinforcement, but regardless of what future research in this area shows us, I think one thing is clear, and that is that if we're going to understand choice behavior, 
we have got to get a good understanding of how delay of reinforcement affects animals and people's choices. Thank you. Well, I, I've wondered about that. Uh, the question was, uh, in concurrent chain schedules where we're dealing with much longer delays, is it possible that the decay function for pigeons, for instance, would, wouldn't be one or two seconds, but something longer? Would it depend on the procedure you use? And my answer is, I've wondered about that myself. My intuition tells me that it might. The trick is I haven't figured out a good way to measure K in those procedures. Uh, and uh, I need to work on that a little bit more. It would certainly be interesting and throw a wrench into a lot of our theorizing if uh, we had to figure out a new value of K depending on what every situation is. But it may be relative to the something about the, the overall lengths of delays that we're talking about. Um, my hunch is that it may, but I don't have any data. Yeah, Ben. In the current chains, you're, you have delay relations between the response that initiated the terminal link, but you also have them with other responses prior to that. Do you include those other responses so that if an animal pecks on the left and then he pecks on the right and starts the terminal link, The way the model works is it calculates for each side independently how much time is likely to elapse from the start of the initial link to reinforcement on that side. So yes, it will include time the animal is actually pecking on the other white key, for example, as part of the overall delay to one side or the other. The, uh, am I making myself clear? Uh, all right, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the animal pecks left, pecks right, gets a terminal link, gets reinforcement. That reinforcer only affects the strength of the right, not the left. That may also be an assumption that is incorrect. All models, I mean, well, not most models that I'm familiar with make that assumption, uh, that left responses get strengthened by left reinforcers and not vice versa. That's also a questionable hypothesis. I've asked the question in part because of Charlie Catania's presentation this morning where he was arguing that things much further back uh, get uh, some delayed reinforcement effect. I've recently started thinking that exactly what you're saying may be the case, that maybe there is some carryover because of this sort of delayed reinforcement effect. If so, it's going to 
give us a lot more work in the coming years because the matching law, delay reduction theory, all of these theories assume that there is this sort of division of reinforcers and responses left and right. And uh, if there is this carryover, well, it's going to be a tough one to model, I think. that question too for uh, for the tape uh, whether the fact that we're looking at relative response rates obvious that I, I don't think so I mean it's kind of hard to explain without a blackboard but uh, it may if it's the fact that the animal makes a left response then a right response then gets reinforced and somehow that reinforcer is affecting the left response we'd like to know about it and include it in the model but it isn't included in any of the models that we're dealing with. Um, without getting into this in a lot of detail, uh, it's possible to build a model where you would say, you take the reinforcer as it occurs, maybe this is what Ben is getting at, and look backward in time and assume that all responses, either left or right, were strengthened according to some sort of decaying function, the way Charlie Catania claims is happening. And if so, that's a very different model than what most of us have been dealing with lately. It may be necessary to do that, but uh, I don't know anybody other than Charlie who's seriously tried to do that. <laughs> 